know that you're here and we're glad to have you. One of the things we like to do is kind of kick off with a little bit of an icebreaker conversation piece. And um, today I wanted to ask you all um, to maybe chat in if you want to just speak in for a minute um, what you have been doing to build immunity lately or what are ways that you are creating resilience for yourself in this time. So if you got recipes for immunity, what do you do right now? Um, we'd all love to hear it. So let's take a minute and share um, and read what people have to say. And we'll jump into to today's conversation. Eating healthy food. <laughs> Someone better have said that. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. So for today's conversation, I'm really excited because we have um, about seven great farmers of different scales, different products, different experiences, different markets um, that we've brought together and just figured it was a really good time um, and where we're at to hear back on um, how our farmers have dealt with this last season, what lessons have been learned, what they were able to do to fortify themselves and some thoughts on what we can um, be thinking about collectively for the coming year as we know that we're all preparing now and it's such an uncertain time. So I'm not gonna waste too much time talking. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is Fatima Imad. Um, I sit um, on the steering committee for the response team and I'm the president of Mile High Farmers and ED of Frontline Farming, a POC led um, farmer advocacy and food justice organization. Um, and with that, I'm really just gonna let our farmers speak for themselves and we'll just keep that conversation going. Since we have a lot of farmers, if you guys can all put your questions in the chat box and at the very end, we'll take some time to really go through them and I'll monitor and make sure um, that we get to those questions. We'd appreciate questions. Um, and we are gonna start today um, with Sarah from High Water Farms and Silt. So Sarah, if you're ready, I'm gonna pass it to you to introduce yourselves and talk to us and I'll keep time. Hi, thank you, Fatima. Um, I'm excited to be joining you guys today. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, awesome, so I'm gonna just dive right in. We are out in Silt, Colorado and just broke ground in April of this year. So um, I am, uh, well, so first I was asked to start with pronunciation of my last name. So my last name is Tim Chisholm. Um, it can sound like a sneeze if you don't pronounce it right, but it is, it's Tim Chisholm, it's Polish. Uh, but you can just call me Sarah. So um, to dive right in, I, my background is in youth education and urban agriculture. Um, and now I live out in Glenwood Springs. So I'm in more of a rural setting and I'm excited to be applying uh, my skills and background to this setting. So um, I ran a job training program for teenagers on a farm in Salt Lake City. Uh, I did a farming apprenticeship in Massachusetts to learn how to manage eight acres of vegetable production and then have been working on farms um, and with folks out in the Roaring Fork Valley. So we broke ground in April of this year. Uh, we did some fundraising last winter to start High Water Farm. And High Water Farm is a community driven uh, farm project. And so what that means is that we started with building out farm infrastructure with funding that we've gotten um, to really establish the farm and establish our farm operation. And then next year, we anticipate starting a youth program. Uh, we brought 25, at least 25% of our produce to local hunger relief organizations. Um, and the Farm to Food Pantry program and Lift Up has made that extremely possible. Um, so has the Farm Collaborative and the Two Forks Club by offering grants that then we've been able to route produce to the Rocky Mountain Food Bank. Um, and then the WIC program has been really supportive. So through those three programs, we felt like we've been able to make an impact. And I actually like to say that we feel really fortunate to have gotten our start this year because we've been able to adapt um, with the circumstances as opposed to having started last year and implemented sales and things that might've fallen through. That being said, um, COVID has made things particularly challenging. So in the spring, we had a hard time getting a hold of the tools and materials we needed on time um, in order to really get moving. And then we had anticipated building up some relationships with local restaurants for wholesale and that fell through as well. Um, 
we were able to establish this year, first year a half acre of production that's enclosed in three acres of wildlife fencing. And then we have a five acre land lease, so we have room to expand. And that is on publicly conserved land at the Silt River, River Preserve, uh, which is owned by the town of Silt. So that's the context. Um, in, on that half acre, we had an AmeriCorps VISTA that worked with me and then two part-time farmer apprentices we hired um, halfway through the season and we grew 8,000 pounds of produce, which was awesome. Um, and so we're really excited, looking forward to the, to the year ahead. Um, we haven't gotten any COVID response or relief funding yet, but we did apply to the last round. And we are really grateful for this community of supporters. Um, I would say that we, as we look to next year, we will be um, having a CSA in our region that will have about 35 members. And so that's something that we're seeing a lot of farms pivot into to know that they have sustained income for um, this changing market. And then we're also doing a crowdfunding campaign uh, the 1st of December to raise funds for our youth program. So if you follow us, High Water Farm, um, on social media or check out our website, uh, we would love to have folks kind of follow along with the journey and support us where we can. Um, and we're happy to be a part of this conversation. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um... And like, welcome and congratulations on that first year. Um, yeah. And cool, Thank we'll you. come back to some questions. Um, awesome, I'm gonna move on to Don from Green Junction, um, from Green Junction Farmstead in Clifton. Don, are you here? Yeah, can everybody hear me okay? We can. Awesome. Well, thank you, Fatima, for uh, hosting and Wendy, of course, for all your hard work through all, the, all of this. Um, respond and rebuild um, grants that we've, um, all, you know, a lot of people have benefited from this um, through all this crazy COVID. Um, I am with Green Junction Farmstead here in Mesa County. Me and my husband, Brian, we run a, um, we produce on uh, an acre and a half. And this season we're at a hundred members for our CSA. Uh, that also included uh, the WIC program, and we were able to help the mutual aid and the solidarity, not charity, um, food distribution. Um, there was a, um, uh, so when COVID hit, we decided um, to make a huge pivot in our uh, business model, and that was to an online farmer's market. Um, so that um, entailed us um, a, getting a platform for that, a uh, online store platform, getting some online marketing, trying to attract our, um, our uh, customer base that we had already established over the last five years at the farmer's markets um, to try and follow us through that. And also go through um, a repackaging system through our CSA. Normally we would set up market style for our CSA to kind of pick their produce through. And with the COVID, we were unable to do that. So that included a lot more packaging um, um, expenses and things. So we did get uh, granted in round two of the response and rebuild. And that's what we used it for um, was the packaging mostly and some um, labor. Um, in the beginning of COVID, we weren't able to have our normal volunteer base here. And so we had to shift um, once things we were able to kind of unlock and get out of our homes and people were uh, not as worried about getting around other people. We were able to hire some help this season. So that helped with that um, a lot. Um, you know, just the business pop, uh, model pivot um, was not as successful as we wanted it to be. It was, um, you know, people got let out sooner than we anticipated to be able to go and shop in the grocery stores and things again. So I feel like we lost a lot of our revenue through that. And so we made another business uh, decision to start a farm stand here um, and try and attract our normal um, uh, farmer's market customer base to our farm. And so that's always a hard thing to do when people are in lockdown and scared to kind of go out. So. Um, that's been one of our biggest challenges this season through COVID. Um, and uh, life now as a producer is, um, I feel like we're not as scared as we were when um, this all hit because now our business model has changed. We are already going to make this a long-term pivot for us. And so um, we can uh, plan ahead as, as opposed to trying to do it in March when we're trying to do our farm production plan. So 
Um, I feel like that that's uh, in our benefit this season. And, um, you know, just to um, the, the things that I saw that went well is the communication between producers, these respond and rebuild um, funds have brought a lot of people to the table to be able to communicate about small and mid-sized farms and um, food scarcity and how to get um, funds and grants and help out uh, to those producers and processors and people that really need it to keep this uh, food security and this food movement uh, continuing forward. And so that's what I feel like um, in 2020, uh, excuse me, 2021, uh, that's where our business is headed towards is um, just um, sticking with the, the new uh, model that we have and also being able to reach out to producers and people even on the statewide level. So um, I, that's, I think the bright side, the light at the end of this tunnel is that we will all still be in communication with each other and uh, continuing forward with this food movement. Thanks, Don. Um, and um, I like that solidarity, not charity, and for bringing that spirit with you today. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for all you do. <laughs> cool. Um, I'm going to come back around um, to some of these questions. There is one in there for you at the end. Um, and I'm going to move us on to, or we could just take a minute maybe. Um, I do see this question from Casey here that says, Don, would you do the farm stand again next year if we were, if we're still in COVID? And then just a quick question of what platform did you use? And that's for your online market. Yeah, so we used the Barn to Door platform and um, <laughs> that was a huge challenge. Um, also trying to learn this whole online process we're farmers and we're not good at technology and so that was a huge um you know monster that we had to um it's a great platform it wasn't as successful as we want I feel like our community is kind of small for that and um I feel like we were able to go uh the community was able to go shop freely <laughs> too soon um but um and then I will do the farm stand again that is a permanent um and I do it in a way that I handle the food and I package the food in bags for them and um, I'm only allow a, a person or two. So, you know, it's a small farm stand. It's just the beginning and uh, of it. So it's, um, yeah, I'm just trying to uh, go by the rules, you know, and keep things safe and stuff. So yes, I would do that again. Um, thanks, Don. All right, I'm going to keep us moving on to Roberto Mesa here. Um, and go ahead, Roberto. Thank you, Fatima. Hi, everybody. Hope everyone's having a good morning. Um, my name is Roberto Mesa. I am co founder and one of the farmers of Emerald Gardens. We're a microgreens farm operating in a sustainable commercial greenhouse uh, year round on 35 acres in Bennett, Colorado. Uh, our primary market streams uh, since 2017 have been restaurants and independent grocery stores throughout the Denver, Boulder, and Fort Collins area. And um, now um, recently have been, well, I would say the work has been incubating for a long time. Um, but one of the challenges that we faced as a small producer um, on the Eastern Plains was um, solving our distribution challenges. Uh, because at the time when we were growing, we were still too too small to be taken up by a major distributor and also too large to handle our own distribution. So we were in that in-between kind of no man's um, place where we were just having a lot of difficulty trying to expand, trying to leverage the resources we have to be able to make our business financially viable because we are looking at large scale production. And so we leaned into our co collaborative and cooperative partnerships with um, an organization called High Plains Food Co-op that allowed us to pull in our resources and then start essentially um, democratizing the work of distribution. We realized that we were going to the same places, that we could help them increase their market outreach and their access to different revenue streams. And so we started using our farm uh, this was about a year before COVID as a way to pilot alternative distribution methods based on collaborative um, values. And that's how we were able to really learn a lot about 
um, you know, the flow of food and the mechanics of, of food distribution and aggregation through our, our communities. And when COVID hit, we realized that we already had this wealth of knowledge to be able to make this happen in a time when supply chains were being interrupted and communities were having trouble accessing food. So through the partnerships that we built in that previous year with Fondadosa and High Plains Food Co-op, we already had a model that could come in to help us mitigate the economic fallout from COVID. And one of the things that we started to do was piloting the direct to consumer model, which not only helped Emerald Gardens, but also the producers in our immediate regions and in High Plains Food Co-op. And one of the beautiful things that came out of that was just the resiliency and the stubbornness to make it work and to remain here as viable components of our communities. Um, and that was a big kind of wake up call for us that we actually had a model that could satisfy both the immediate needs that were being created by COVID and that they were affecting local producers as well as communities. And we realized that Emerald Gardens as a farm producer uh, was more equipped to focus on production whereas the aggregation, distribution, and the kind of knowledge um, that we were generating doing the work of a food hub was basically a, an entity into and of itself. And so we created and launched the East Denver Food Hub um, to solidify that work. And that allowed us really to um, partner with organizations, um, mostly um, groups that were doing food access work, uh, especially Live Well, Now Nourish, um, and food pantries. And since I'm also part of the Denver Sustainable Food Policy Council, as well as a, um, a regional food coordinator with Hunger Free Colorado, we kind of already had a good assessment of the landscape of food access and how to engage and activate those partnerships that I had been cultivating prior to COVID. And all of this kind of came to fruition in a way that um, actualized the network and the mechanics and the knowledge that we had been generating by doing the work on the ground that was now informing our perspectives on a high level of what our food system actually needs to build in resiliency, equity, and justice. And so now we have this wonderful synergy between Emerald Gardens, which is the for-profit um, kind of year-round operation on our farm, and the East Denver Food Hub, which is also a social enterprise for profit to create some uh, economic um, sustainability in the work that we're doing to feed communities. And so we essentially tried to rapid prototype new models for our food system that were built on partnerships with LiveWell through the WIC programs and local procurement strategies for food pantries. All of that food access work has now enabled us to scale into an analysis of what it would take to actually have a brick and mortar location in Denver that can en encapsulate a lot of the things that we've been working on, scale our food hub model, uh, focused on food access while at the same time addressing economic justice and leveraging the resources that we have on Emerald Gardens at Emerald Gardens to remove as many barriers of entry for young beginning farmers, BIPOC farmers, community members who want to um, actually address their own um, kind of farming operation. And now they have the option of either going through the Emerald Gardens brand, which we now have a partnership with a major distributor, or through um, East Denver Food Hub, which is still addressing and trying to lift up communities through local procurement strategies and policy initiatives. Um, so we're really looking at actually solidifying a location where we can incorporate a kind of um, uh, economic assessment of food access currencies and programs, as well as um, leveraging our resources, incorporating and integrating the local food system, and generating research, analysis, markers, and metrics for this ultimate project of food sovereignty that we're trying to institute and execute. Um, so I think all of that just relies on building partnerships, coalitions, and um, and increasing our network and outreach. So we're, we're here to explore more as we continue into the next year.
Awesome. Thanks, Roberto. It's a lot going on and um, just a lot of amazing work. Thank you for sharing. I'm sure we'll have questions at the end. I'm going to move us on to another region as well. Um, Mr. Bai from Southwest Farm Fresh in Cortez, you here with us? I'm actually not seeing Oli. I'm not either. All right, I'm going to keep us Sorry, moving. Everybody. That's all right. Yeah. We're going to go on to Greeley. Um, Derek Hoffman with Hoffman Farms. Are you here? <laughs> yeah, yes, I am. Awesome. Uh, can you hear, well, can you hear yeah, me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Yes. Uh, so I'm uh, Derek Hoffman, and uh, myself and my wife, Hanmei Hoffman, uh, we uh, operate a uh, hundred acre, about, or about a hundred acres uh, north of Greeley. Uh, um, in 2020, uh, 52 acres of it was in vegetable production. This is a, we just completed our sixth season, um, so we're still kind of a, uh, you know, a young operation, still finding our way. Um, coming into this year, uh, 2018, uh, you know, we, uh, we had some challenges where we lost 60% of our, our crops to weather events in 2018, 2019, um, was a, it was a good year for production, but we were only able to, uh, sell about 60% of what we, we grew, uh, due to lack, lack of market, maybe lack of demand. Um, so we had real questions coming into 2020, what we were going to do. So we actually uh, uh, cut back acreage. We cut back about 26 acres of vegetable production coming into 2020. Uh, and uh, uh, we had this idea of doing a farm stand um, to try to generate new customers uh, in our area. There's really no farm stand north of the Brighton area along the 85 um, US 34 corridor. And then COVID hit about, about March. And, um, you know, then, then started the, the kids going to work with you every day for five months. And uh, um, our, our questions really were, okay, the die had been set. We had already purchased everything. We had our plan in place for what we we're gonna do. Um, we, uh, our markets, um, about 75% is institutional selling. Um, then we still were doing two farmers markets and uh, you know, a little bit with distribution, not too much. And then uh, we worked with a lot of aggregate CSAs in the Denver metro area. So the question was, is, uh, do we have a place for our product? And uh, so we, uh, we went ahead with what we had planned in 2019, what our 2020 year was gonna look like, and uh, we didn't pivot. Um, when it came to the farmer's markets, they were delayed opening a little bit. And um, we opted, since we're doing two, we opted just to do one. Uh, the thought was, is, do we know if customers are even going to show up to the farmer's markets with the new requirements and will they come out? So instead of losing money in two locations, we decided, well, let's just chance it on one. And uh, we did the Fort Collins, uh, Larimer County farmer's market. And, uh, um, and, and I think our assumptions were a little, a little wrong. Um, the Fort Collins market, uh, we saw not necessarily double, but about uh, about a 40 to 50 percent increase in traffic and revenue. And uh, the the restrictions um, they they changed through the summer and became um, less. And so it was easy to work through that. Uh, the institutional buying, uh, we talked to our school districts we had worked with in the past, and they said, you know, if when we open, uh, due to COVID. You know, following health guidelines, um, we won't have our salad bars open if we're in in-person learning. So we won't be buying as much as what they told us. And so it's like, okay, well, well, you know, what do we do? Well, what ended up happening is, is whether they were in in-person or online learning, um, there was a sudden surge that these these school districts started, for lack of a better word, packaging food, packaging meals, and sending them home with the kids. So right when we were worried about our business to kind of the September, October timeframe when we make about, I'd say about 75% of our overall gross revenue. Um, we had numerous school districts step up and the purchasing was, was much larger. And we actually heard from four different school districts that we hadn't worked with before. So we saw an increase in institutional buying. Then on the other side of it through the summer, working with the aggregate CSAs, one of them uh, actually started an emergency food box program. So we saw a high demand on that side as well. So um, working through uh, 
the summer, we didn't know what to expect. We really were worried about what do we do with our product. And um, overall, I can say, as our season is done, we've sold, uh, I would say, about 95% of everything we harvested. And in some cases, uh, we couldn't meet the demand um, uh, for these emergency food boxes, the USDA One food box. Uh, the aggregate CSA saw a large uh, increase in membership in the March, April timeframe. And um, these schools uh, operating, trying to do uh, um, some sort of fresh fruits and vegetables for students, whether they're online or uh, in-person learning. So um, I'd say overall, uh, when the season's done, I, I think our sales are up and I think our overall gross revenue is probably up by one or two percent. The real concern going into 2021 is, is that we know 2020, there was a lot of federal funding behind a lot of what was happening. Um, grants, uh, private funding, things like that. Um, so we're kind of, kind of what's going to happen in 2021. We know our personal belief is, is that this is going to be identical to 2020. Um, we don't see much changing. Um, we do hope that maybe by fall of 2021 schools are online again or not online, uh, in person again. Uh, sorry. We just switched online here this week up here in Greeley. Um, so we hope more normalcy next year. And, and then when that normalcy returns, the question is, is will we have the customers? Will we go back to 2019 where there isn't that local demand? Um, uh, so it's the concern in 2021 is customer base. Um, and for uh, the, the grants, we did take part in the PPP uh, only because our bank that we bank at said, hey, we noticed you didn't take part in any of this. Uh, you need to apply it. So it was like the third round of PPP we did apply. Um, for the employee protection, uh, just a little bit of money. And then uh, for the Colorado Rebuild Fund, uh, we did apply in round one and that money was applied towards uh, cold storage, which uh, actually did help with us working with these institutions and um, uh, um, school districts. So um, that's just kind of the, the overall, um, definitely, cha definitely challenging year. Um, one thing I'm grateful for is the weather wasn't challenging, which was the first of many. Um, but yeah, look into 2021. Um, yeah, uh, you know, what will the customer base look like in 2021? Thank you. That was a lot of information. Um, some things I didn't expect, like about institutional buying, and certainly appreciate you sharing about like the concerns you have, and that resonates a lot for me as well. Um, I just want to go ahead and um, address one of the questions to you, where um, somebody asked, "What about the labor um, situation on your farm this summer?" Oh, uh, good point. So, um, in the springtime, we we. I mean, just we're, cre we're creatures of habit. So when that disruption happened in March, I mean, it interrupted everybody's daily habits. So there was a lot of panic and I, I will admit I was concerned, but um, we were, uh, you know, you just don't want panic and fear to take over. So we, we were steadfast in what we were doing this year, but the, the labor part of it is, is we actually held off hiring any employees. And so it was just my wife and I uh, up until about mid-June, mid-June was about when you saw things kind of settle down, that fear and a retraction of the panic. So we actually brought a full-time employee in on that. And then once we were in the field, kind of July through uh, September, um, we couldn't go a day without somebody pulling in, looking for work. And I don't think it was related to the pandemic so much as the collapse in the hemp industry. The hemp market fell off in 2019. And there was a lot of people that had worked vegetables, had switched over to hemp due to higher wages that were being paid, and then they were coming back to vegetables. So we actually put together a good team of about five employees uh, to do the field work, and um, it worked out well. Um, uh, I think if there was something that we could do going into 2021, um, if there was funding or grants, um, I think ideally if it could focus on labor, because I think that is actually an issue small, medium, and large for all farms is labor. Um, I didn't have the impact in labor we thought. Um, so uh, going back into 2021, um, I suspect at least two or three of those employees are going to return next year. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, I guess that is still another uncertainty going into 2020. Because <laughs> yeah, general labor is not somebody people are just clamoring to do. But uh, um, so yeah, uh, I guess it would be still a concern going into 2021. 
Awesome. Thank you. Um, a quick last question. How many acres do you all operate? Or have um, in production? Um, it's a uh, hundred and three um, and it's 52 in vegetables. Um, I think we're going to stick around about 50 acres next year, but we are bringing two more farms online. We do have uh, just a standard commodity operation on the side, um, which does help with rotation. Um, so uh, I, I suspect we're going to be about 137 next year, but again, about 50 in the vegetables. And it could change. I mean, there could be uh, all of a sudden there could be over the winter contracts coming in through uh, uh, distribution or something that may change our minds. But right now, ideally about 50 is about where we need to operate for our customer base. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I'm yeah. sure we'll have some questions at the end. That was wonderful. Sure. Um, I'm going to shift us to um, Nancy Roberts of Arrow Point Cattle Co. Um, I know you're here, Nancy, so I'm going to pass it on to you. Hi, good morning. I hope everybody's having a great day. Um, so we do, we're a little different from everybody else that has spoken. We raise grass bed, grass finished Highland beef. We have about 75 mama cows. And because Highlands mature so much later than your commercial cow, we have that many yearlings and that many um, calves as well. Um, we raise Highlands for many reasons. First, they're great moms. Um, they're easy calvers. They are very resilient, very disease tolerant, and they love our winters here. Um, I really don't have to worry about predators. Um, they've treed bears, they've chased off um, coyotes. I mean, they're, they're very resilient. It's, it's really great. Um, also, my dad had them before I was born. So we have cows from that same lineage all the way through until now. So that was a long time ago. Although I still feel like I learned something new all the time. Um, we were really lucky and thrilled to get a respond and rebuild grant in round one. Um, our primary customer is a local restaurant. And of course, due to COVID, they had to shut down in the spring. Um, so we had to make a pretty swift shift to um, direct sales and that meant revamping our website, doing some marketing. We went to a farmer's market um, and that the grant really helped us pay for the website and a bunch of marketing stuff, which we really hadn't done very much of, to be honest. And we should have been doing it for you know years, but we hadn't. Um, Life now on COVID, on a day-to-day -day basis for us, it really doesn't impact our day-to-day -day because we spend almost every day outside, you know, outside stuff. So it's it's not such an impact, but it impacts all of our customer base. Um, the biggest issue that I see with the is that we're all getting pandemic fatigue, for lack of a better. Thing to call it. It's harder to get things done. It's harder to um, get supplies that you need because of the systemic, you know, fatigue. I think that we see throughout our whole, our whole world. Um, a particular nightmare for us this year was processing. Um, our processor that we used for the last ten years went out of business has now reopened, but he's not no longer doing USDA. So all of ours, because they go to a restaurant or direct market, have to be USDA inspected. Um, and because of COVID, all the processors were completely filled. I mean, it was just really a nightmare. We drove a long ways, went to processors that not necessarily would want to in the future, um, but any port in the storm. So we feel better for next year as far as that goes, but you know, um, we feel really lucky. The owner of the restaurant that we supply really thinks outside of the box. And when, um, and when he saw that the restaurant was going to close, he shifted his business to do a bunch of carryout meals and meal meals that were already prepped. 
so that people could come by and pick them up and take them. So that really helped us, you know, that took a little while, but, um, and really the people that we have, and we have one full-time guy and one part-time guy. So they have really pitched in and been really positive through all of this, which is, you know, it's the positivity and the optimism that things will be okay. And that we all feel that way has made a huge, huge difference for us. Um, the restaurant had a really good summer, all things considered. Um, what they sell changed. And so we've had to change our products to match that a little bit, which is really hard. Um, but they do take the entire animal. They just, you know, cut it a little different and use a little different parts of it. Um, I worry with resurgence of COVID that will have to, that the restaurants will have to close again. That's probably my biggest my biggest fear. Um, we have made it a shift to the direct market and have increased that and seen an increase, but we're a long, long ways away from where we should be and from where um, we could sustain ourselves if the restaurants actually closed. Um, that's that's our biggest our biggest challenge. Really, is is the market. That's not what we're really good at. Um, we'd all rather be outside doing, you know, <laughs> stuff with the cows than we would be uh, inside working on marketing, but it's, you know, it's part of it. I am really excited to see 2020 in my rear view mirror and looking forward to 2021 hopefully being better. Um, and I have to say, I'm super impressed with, with from Emerald Gardens, how do you manage to have the time to do all of that volunteer, all of that other work along with farming? Because that's, it's a challenge for me to do volunteer work and to do the ranching. So thank you all very much. Let me know if you have questions. Awesome. Thank you. There's a lot of gems in there. Um, you do have a question here um, from Casey that if you do know, um, can you speak more about the processor that closed and reopened? Like had they closed before the pandemic and then the need reopened them? And then I don't know if you know about the USDA, like reason why they didn't, was it just the significant barriers um, that that poses? Um, so yeah. So he, he was a USDA facility before and they closed for health reasons, but they re, he reopened without USDA because he said that the USDA paperwork and coordination, and I, I, I know I was on a call last week with USDA, um, and it's harder and harder to get the inspectors and timely, and, but mostly from what he said, it was mostly the paperwork. Wonderful. Um, yeah, and I, I really take your point on, you know, um, how when the pandemic hit, we really kept trying to be humble and count our blessings of like just the ability for our days not to change, you know, and getting to be outside. And so we knew also um, for us being like vegetable producers that this time would come where we'd be coming back inside too. So um, it's a it's a shift in realities that a lot of people have been in already. So um, thanks for bringing that like reality to it. Um, you have another question here. That's how do folks find your direct market website? And is that local to your area or are you shipping? Um, we've shipped a little bit, but most of it is local or to, we deliver to Colorado Springs and to Denver um, on, because we have people going there anyway. Um, but the, we've done a lot of Facebook ads that, that seems to be the predominant. We also did a CPR um, radio ad for a while and We've done some flyers, some direct sale, um, direct mailings. So we've tried a little bit of everything. Thank you. Um, I wanted to open up this time and just really quickly, let me also check in case um, our person is here from Fire Runners Hotchkiss. Is anyone here from there? 
I don't think so. All right, that's all good. So um, this was truly wonderful, just like such an array of different things going on um, and sounds like just so much resilience and in some ways um, still finding ways to succeed, um, which I feel like farmers would tell that story um, all the time, regardless, you know, you're out there doing the work, so bless you. Um, that said, I just wanted to open it up and see if anybody had any questions for um, our speakers today. And even from the speakers, if you guys have questions for each other, um, I wanted to give a minute for that. And um, I also have some. Um, yeah, this is Oli with Southwest Farm Fresh. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, Oli, you made it. Please go ahead. Yeah, go yeah I'm here. I've been here. Go, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I know. Do you want me, you need me to give a rundown we, of what we're doing? And yeah, we would, love you we would love you to. Please go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, well, my name's Oli, and I'm the general manager at uh, Southwest Farm Fresh Cooperative down here in Cortez in the bottom left hand corner of the state. And um, we are a producer owned co-op and we do marketing and distribution uh, of products from our member farms and uh, other uh, local and regional products as well. And our main market now is an online uh, farmer's market that we opened up in May. And historically we've been focused mostly on doing restaurant wholesaling. And um, we decided to get away from that this winter. And uh, that was a good choice. And um, 2020 was very good for our business. Um, at least historically, we're still not, I wouldn't say we're not struggling, but uh, I finally feel like um, there's a light at the end of the tunnel and the online market model has been uh, very promising for us. And it's a pretty good fit for our producers as well. Uh, we've seen um, a lot more variety. And uh, when there's uh, fluctuation in supply, um, it's a lot um, less risky for our marketplace now. And uh, we have a lot of, we've developed a really good uh, customer base over the summer and uh, feel like we have a lot of loyal customers um, who uh, might not otherwise have uh, joined our CSA in past years. Um, and it's been really a huge um, unburdening to get away from the CSA model and uh, particularly to get away from restaurant-based wholesaling. And, uh, you know, the pandemic's been really challenging um, in terms of uh, being able to plan for the future, but um, it's uh, not as difficult to deal with as um, the unpredictable nature of the restaurant market and the tur turnover in chefs and, um, you know, we have dealt a lot with resort uh, restaurants and it's just impossible to um, keep up with who's uh, supposed to be putting in orders and really um, being on top of people on order day. Um, to get away from that has been a huge blessing and uh, we've really embraced the online market and we were scared of all the uh, logistics and all the sorting um, when we went into it and I was really skeptical and uh, in fact it wasn't even my idea and uh, I got kind of pushed back on it and um, I was unsuccessful and that's uh, probably a good thing in hindsight. Um, I think uh, we've really seen that it has a lot of potential to reach new customers in our area and um, we're really uh, really optimistic, I think, about the model going forwards, um, even even not knowing what uh, is going to happen with COVID. So, um, and we, we did get a little, uh, one of those grants, I think, in the first round. And uh, I think it was applied to some of the uh, marketing and outreach that we've done that's been different and some uh, PBE stuff too. We just um, 
you know, and all that's been very difficult to find, as I'm sure everybody knows, uh, finding packaging, finding gloves and masks online is um, not easy. And we're just making the switch over to using N95 masks for everybody, all our volunteers and staff and drivers. And uh, I would recommend that for everybody else too. Um, and um, I think that's uh, about all I can um, think of to summarize kind of where we're at and what we've been doing. Um, and I, I, I'm uh, in the vehicle driving, so if there's questions, uh, maybe the moderator can uh, relay them to me. Yeah, thank you, Ari. That was great. Um, yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, so um, some of the questions, we have a question here that's kind of to everyone um, as well, um, but it, Mel says, you know, that they've struggled with dissonance with COVID when it's at bay, so fluctuations with people buying online and then going gangbusters for online shopping when COVID meter is in the orange and red, safer at home. Any thoughts on things that have worked for brand loyalty for anyone? So kind of, you know, how COVID is, when COVID's high, people, you know, really actually start caring and thinking about food um, again um, in that way. So have you guys seen fluctuations like that? And, um, you know, like you said, Oli, that you guys are just going into that online marketing um, and also what platform are you all using? Yeah, um, we uh, started using Local Food Marketplace again this year. And we've used them in the past uh, for wholesaling. And it's, um, you know, it's an affordable software that's uh, created with small scale food systems in mind. Um, and it probably is the best out there. I mean, we spent so many hours researching software over the years and uh, have used a number of the different, um, what I would call entry level options, uh, local orbit. Um, we use that for about a week. Um, and uh, a couple other things that we researched pretty heavily. Um, and at one point we went two years just using spreadsheets. And um, so it's, it's really frustrating and difficult to find a software that can work for whatever it is you're doing um, because they're you know, designed to try to work with everyone and everyone has different needs. And um, there's almost like too many bells and whistles and not enough core functions on a lot of these softwares. And um, we're making local food marketplace work for us. Uh, we still have to like print out a long list of items and cut them up with scissors and staple them together and put them in different bins and, uh, you know, various um, low tech uh, sort of hacks like that. Um, so I don't, I don't think there's a magic bullet unless you're willing to spend, you know, a hundred thousand uh, dollars on customizable food hub software. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, I think local food marketplace is all right and it can work for a lot of different distribution models. Um, and, uh, to return to the core of the question, uh, what, what do we do when, um, people aren't as afraid of COVID and aren't as excited about shopping online? Um, I, I don't know if I'm really worried about it. I feel like, um, it has introduced us to a lot of potential customers that might not otherwise have come our way. Um, and, uh, you know, I certainly want open air farmers markets to kind of come back into their stride once, um, it's safe to mingle again. But, um, you know, I, I don't know. I think that the buy just gets bigger and, um, you know, we've reached, uh, like I said, people we wouldn't have. And, um, not, you know, I am concerned about fluctuations and people um, sort of losing interest. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I guess, too, we just have to move forward um, and um, realize that uh, the future is almost totally unpredictable. So, um I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that we'll be able to retain our customer base uh, in future years uh, through this model that we're using. So thanks. Thank you. Um, that's like 
reassuring optimism is helpful right now, you know? So um, thank you for that. <laughs> and it is so hard to answer questions and everything is in flux and we're just responding to it. So thanks for attempting. Um, and um, should I take this last question, Wendy? Yeah, I'm mean, just gonna see if anyone has any insight. In some ways it's a little philosophical, but um, have you all, any of our speakers today, what, you know, have you asked your customers or even in your own thinking, what do you all think um, is gonna help, you know, keeping um, buyers um, buying from local producers right now and not returning to like conventional grocery shopping for the future? Does anyone have thoughts on that? I would um, chime in on that if I may. I <clears throat> it was um, it was kind of hard to <clears throat> reach our clientele that we had built up at farmers markets to uh, redirect them. <clears throat> excuse me to my online store, and then also to our new farm stand because um, maybe it was lack of us trying to um, keep track of those customers, but. Um, you know, that's a sense of community when you're at the farmer's market. And so I think that um, what one is they know that when they come to my farm and they buy my produce, it's fresh and it's going to last them a long time. And um, that's really one of the things that my customers say most, but they also really appreciated the safety measures that we took um, when we did to have contact and the uh, business model pivot that we had um, for our CSA. It was a pre-packaged pre box that was delivered or a drop site that they had no contact. Um, and then, um, you know, our practices with a drive-through pickup for our CSA or even our online farmers uh, market customers. So I think the safety issue was uh, really uh, tantalizing to uh, keep our customers coming back to the to the farm stand. And so that works for us in the future because that I feel like um, COVID really put us fast forward into a direction that we kind of wanted to go anyway, but it really kind of lit that fire. And um, so we our, our intention really was to have our customer base come and be here at the farm to see where their food is grown anyhow. So that was the benefit of of that and also, you know, our safety measures to um, just protect everybody and keep everybody safe was was the reason, one of the reasons they've come back. Thank you, that was thoughtful. Um, and like, yeah, we don't often think about how the difference between the safety measures we're taking and just going to the grocery store. So um, appreciate that insight. So I feel like I could keep this conversation going all day, but out of respect for everyone's time, um, I'm gonna pass it to Wendy to close us out for today and get us out by 12. Um, and just wanna take a minute and give our speakers a round of applause some thumbs up and just um, give you our gratitude. Like, you know, we know that you're all farming. We see you all out there. Um, um, keep up the good work and thanks for sharing your knowledge and wisdom that's priceless with us today. So um, with that, I'll pass it on to Wendy. Awesome. Thank you, Fatima. And thank you all of our presenters and taking this time to be with us today. So I just want to close this out with a few um, sort of quick re few reminders and updates uh, about what's coming next. Um, one is I just posted a reminder in the chat there to join our Slack channel. Um, if you have not already, it is a good place to post a lot of these kind of questions that you're asking of each other right now for ideas and resources. Um, so you can always share on Slack any day of the month. Um, a couple of quick updates as well. Um, the third round of the um, Respond and Rebuild Fund, as you know, has been closed. Um, and just a quick update on uh, what, we, what we have received there. So we received a total of 320 applications um, that representing 226 producers, 33 processors and 61 intermediaries for a total of $5.8 million worth of requests. Um, so that actually brought up, that alone brought up a lot for me that I'm glad that um, obviously there is, this is resonating. This is a resource that is needed and we're addressing a need. Um, that is also a pretty significant response that to me also demonstrates um, a pretty big gap in resources and support for a lot of you. So um, 
those process, those applications are being reviewed right now. Review should be done by December 3rd, uh, and the fund then hopes to make announcements on that um, early the week of December 7th. So that's the update there. Um, also, I will chat in. There's a lot of this posted on Slack, but just as a reminder that CSAP 2.0 uh, applications are being considered just September 21st until December 11th. Um, so I will chat in some resources as well around that CFAP um, 2.0 resources and a guide that explains a lot of how it's operating now and it's different than the first round. So I will chat that in as well. And again, these are always on Slack. Um, and then I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what we're going to be doing next together. Um, so save the date uh, and I will put this in the chat box as well. Um, save the date for our next call. Um, similar to November, obviously there's, um, you guys are always busy, but also with holidays and other things going on, we're only having this one call in November and then only one call in December and may get back on to a sort of every other week call uh, schedule in January. Um, but so we'll have one call in December and it will be sort of a, a special session, a special call. It'll be uh, Thursday, December 17th. I'm chatting this in now. Um, it is gonna be an hour and a half long call. It'll start at the same time. So it's still Thursday starting at 11. We're gonna go until 12.30. Um, and as I've chatted in here, mobilizing rapid response with Colorado farmers and ranchers, COVID 2020. So we're just gonna take some time that day with several members of the team uh, to do an hour long panel presentation, really sort of reflecting on the intent um, and the actual maybe impact <laughs> of this response team. Um, so take some time to reflect on our process, which from the very beginning has aimed to be um, very data-driven and very people-driven. So from the beginning, we have aimed to both listen and learn and adapt and respond, but also do um, data collection from the fund, from other um, efforts that are going on across the state to then drive the work of this response team so it truly can be responsive um, to you all uh, and your partners. So we want to take some time to reflect on what that process has sort of led to in 2020 and sort of maybe what that is going to inform us um, to do our path forward in 2021. So to have a good, pretty rich panel and then have a good half an hour for some Q&A so we can do this in partnership with you and just stay on track together and know that we are, we're listening, we're adapting, and we are being responsive as we move forward. So I just chatted that in. And yes, thank you. Good question. And so we are asking for RSVPs. Do not worry. You get plenty of emails from us. Um, we're not requiring registration, but we are asking for an RSVP for this one. We just want to kind of have a sense going into it, how many people to expect, who's going to be there. And we will be sending out an actual more formal invitation um, uh, in the coming days here that we ask you to share far and wide as well. So please RSVP, even if you're on this list, but don't worry, you won't get lost. Um, just we have a sense that you're gonna be there. Um, and with that, I will let you all go. Thank you so much to our speakers and all of you for all of your time and great questions. Good Thursday afternoon to you all. Bye-bye. And Amber, are you still on the line? Yes, I'm here. Hey. Hey. Um, great. As some of you know, we some of us kind of just hang out for a few minutes here to make sure we've captured everything. Um, so feel free to jump in with questions as we just make sure we got the recording and we can capture all the chats before we hang up. Um, and Unfortunately, I had to record today, which means someone's going to have to help me figure out what to do. So, uh, yes, Casey, I saw your question. Yeah, Amber, let's send this recording and chat directly to Casey for sure. Yep. And Wendy, um, you can just like, right. start yeah. recording now. Okay, I'm going to hit stop. Okay. <laughs>